chapter 11, verse 16, to the end of the chapter. Joshua chapter 11, verse 16. So Joshua took the entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills. From Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon, he captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Except for the Hivites living in Gibeon, not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites from the hill country, from Hebron, Debir, and Anab, from all the country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses. And he gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to the tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. We pray God will bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, once again, we thank you that we can open your word. We pray now that you speak to each of our hearts, that we might be encouraged and built up as we seek your blessing, as we preach your word. Father, we ask this in the name of Jesus and for your glory. Amen. So believe it or not, we're on week 17 of our journey following Joshua and the Israelites through this book. And today we're looking at God keeping his promises when facing giants. When facing giants. Last year when we set out on the very first session, way, way back, we set out that the book can be split into four different sections. The first was about crossing the Jordan. The second was about conquering the land. The third was about dividing the land. And the fourth is about keeping faith with one another and the Lord, their God, Yahweh. And we distill that into four little phrases, going over, taking, dividing, and worshipping. And we spent most of the last 17 sessions, as we've gone through this book of Joshua, looking at military campaigns. And particularly these last weeks, we've looked at the conquering of the southern kingdom, and then the northern kingdom last week. And we're rapidly heading to the end of the conquering phase in this book of Joshua. After today, all we've got left of the first half of Joshua is a list of defeated kings. And we're going to be looking at that next week. And I need someone to come and read the Bible for me next week with all those names. Have we got any volunteers? Alison, thank you. <laughs> you did it once before, you can do it again. But before we get there, I thought it would be useful, it was helpful to us to have a little bit of a review this morning. There was a sergeant major... And he growled at this young soldier. He said, I didn't see you at camouflage training this morning. And the young squad, he said, thanks very much, sir. <laughs> Military always do debriefs. And I think our young soldier thought that this was somewhat of a debrief. But when they do a debrief, the military, they have this whole review and with no sort of blame attached to it, they go through the whole campaign of what they've done or the new weapon or the new aircraft, whatever it is, and they sit down and they analyse it and they say, how could we make it better? How could we make it more effective? How could we make it more efficient? And they go through it so they can improve tactics and weaponry. And some of these debriefs now, they take place in business. Business have adopted the same practices. They do debriefs on events and, and processes in order that they might make more efficiencies in business. So I want us this morning to do our own debrief, our own debrief of where we've been so far, so far as we review this campaign to conquer the land, as we rapidly come to the end of, of, of phase two, as it were, the first half of the book. We're not going to go over all of the events you'll be pleased to know this morning, but we are going to be led by the writer of Joshua to just to look at four things which are in this particular passage that we've read for ourselves this morning. Second slide, please, William. 
So, this is our first point. Mission accomplished. If we read in verses 16 to 18, we find the first thing that's said is that the land was conquered. It was mission accomplished. Oh, I didn't realise William wasn't here. Move, next slide, William, please. <laughs> Sorry. Next slide, everybody. <laughs> well, get new staff next week, don't worry. So it's mission accomplished. And, and we said, didn't we? Thank you, William. There it is. There's the two battle things that we've been looking at these past few weeks. But it's not been without its problems, has it, over these past sessions that we've looked at. You know, when they came to the River Jordan in the spring floods, it was a problem. And then they had to have surgery and they were vulnerable. We had the situation at AI where they, where they got it wrong and they got too overconfident and they excluded God from it and they lost. 34 were killed and, and, and they were running away from the enemy. Then we had Achan. He didn't do as he was told and he nicked some of the plunder and he kept it for himself. He then was stoned. He was buried. Then we had the Gibeonite deception. They were conned by people who said they lived out of the land when they didn't. They lived in the land and they fell for it and they they made a pact in the name of God and then there was the challenging marches at night time there's been a lot of challenges along the way that we've been with these people and then we've got these armies that seemingly are so far superior you know the numbers and the technology they had at the time far superior to the Israelite army at the time but it's also not been without its good stuff in fact great stuff what about the water backing up on the River Jordan for 16 miles and then five miles in that direction, 21 miles slot of dry riverbed that the people could cross across, that they actually made it into the promised land. What about the, the walls falling down in Jericho with pinpoint accuracy so that Rahab and her family were saved, yet everything else collapsed around them? What about the meeting of Joshua with the commander of the Lord's army? What an exciting event that was. What about the covenant renewal at Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim where they, where they put right with God that which was wrong and they were excited to go again into battle? What about the sun standing still? Just a couple of weeks ago we talked about the, the, the cosmic changes that God caused that the day might be extended, that the battle might be won. It's been an amazing experience, hasn't it, for Joshua and the Israelites. It's been an amazing time that we've been privileged to read about. And I hope it has been for you and I too. Because life's like that, isn't it? There's good bits and there's challenging bits and it's a bit like up and down. But we find in verse 16 that ultimately Joshua took the entire land. And it helpfully gives us the geography. And I'm told by those who are far better at this stuff than I am that basically they took land 40 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So picture the Middle East and Canaan and you've got the Sea of Galilee and 40 miles north of it, they occupied the land, they conquered the land rather, and then somewhere between 5 and 40 miles south of the Dead Sea. They're not that accurate on this because there's a dispute about the exact location of where they think Mount Halak is in the description there, but it's either 5 or 40, so it's a big area. It's quite a stretch down that they conquered in this campaign. So we learn the geographical area of this conquest. So they've won and they've conquered the geography that God had given to them as the promised land. But how long did this take? Well, in verse 18, in this summary, in this debrief, it quite clearly says that Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Now then, we've read a few chapters which ordinarily you could probably read in 20, I don't know, 30 minutes, depending on how quick you read. It wasn't, we think it was some sort of blitzkrieg that was taking place, and they swept through the land, battle after battle after battle, and it was all done and dusted by the time that we finished our own daily devotions in the morning. Not so. The best estimate is that this campaign, this that we've been looking at, took seven years. Seven years of ongoing battles. And this is based on Caleb being 40 when Moses sent him and Joshua as part of the group of spies. Remember the 12 spies that went to the land and they went into for 40 days to spy out the land? Well, Caleb was one of them and when he went, he was 40 years old. And we know from Deuteronomy that the time when the spy, from the time that the spying mission actually uh, entered the land to when they actually got there, it, it was another 38 years. So Caleb was 78 when they crossed over and went into the land at the start of the conquest. And we know from a later chapter, chapter 14 in Joshua, that we'll come to sometime, that Caleb was 85 when he was given the land that was going to be for his tribe. So there were seven years in which these battles were taking place. And most commentators agree that that is the period of time that Joshua had had to battle with the Israelites in the land of Canaan. 
We also know, don't we, that God said it would happen over a period of time. He said it's not just going to happen quickly, else, you know, you won't have enough people to populate the land. It's going to take time. And, and I'm going to be with you, but it's going to take time. Now then, in the same way, we now know that the mission's accomplished, we know the geographical area, and we know that it took seven years. We know that it was a tough time. We know that God was with them throughout, and that he helped them, and he led them, and he gave them instructions. We know that even though God was active in conquering the land, and was in specific acts that we've seen throughout Joshua as we've gone through it, that they weren't the people sat in Gilgal back at the camp, you know, with a feet up for seven years, waiting to wonder what colour paint they were going to use on the front door when they finally moved in and occupied the land. They were involved. And in the same way, we've learned that we, as God's people today, we're operating to God's plan just as they were operating to God's plan. Because God has sent Jesus and he fought the battle and he's won the battle at the cross. We know that, don't we? Hallelujah, this morning he's won the victory. But we know that God allows us to fight for him and that he gives us specific battles which he equips us to fight for him. Here and now in this world. And we know that some of these battles, they're long, aren't they? They're long campaigns. Think about here. 35 and a half years the church has been here trying to reach the community of Appleton. And guess what? They're not all saved yet. 35 years. The campaign for Appleton Cross started years ago when a group of people walked around it more than 10 years ago. These things sometimes take time. And then there's the battles that we, we personally face. You know, the things that you've been praying about perhaps this morning. Battles with sin. Battles with health. Battle with doubts. Battle with relationship problems. Battles with bereavement. Battles which are long, strenuous, tough battles. But we know, don't we, that no matter how these, long these battles go on, that God keeps his promises. And he promises to be with us throughout. He promises to supply all our needs when we're going through those long battles and we also know the territory don't we we know the territory we know that territory which god has won his kingdom it call it his kingdom don't we it's not a place it's you and i we are his kingdom it's his people and this kingdom of his continues to expand and we're part of this place we're part of god's kingdom it's our inheritance for which christ died for us and of course we know that we've got the promised land. We've got glory we're going to one day to look forward to. God's presence in all eternity. Imagine. We go into the promised land. God has said so. One day we're going to settle there permanently. We know that we'll make it. Because like Joshua and the Israelites, as we've seen in this campaign, God does what? He keeps his promises. Third slide please, William. Second thing I want us to know is that God hardened the hearts. Did you read that there again? God himself hardened the hearts. We know, don't we, apart from the Hivites who lived in Gibeon, the Gibeonites, apart from them who conned their way into a peace treaty, the rest of what they went into the land for was conquered, was destroyed under this harem. Remember this word harem where we are told that God said it's got to be total destruction. And we read some things in there, and God had been patient for centuries, hadn't he? He'd been waiting and waiting and waiting for these people to change, but they got worse. They were into pagan worship, child prostitution, child sacrifice. This was the order of the day. And the reminder reminds us it was the Lord himself who hardened the hearts of the people. God himself deliberately, deliberately closed off their hearts and would use them to attack Israel. In order that Israel would respond and overcome them with his help. That he might destroy them completely and rid the land of them. And I know that this has been an issue for us as we've gone through. We've talked about this and we've discussed it. And it's hard, isn't it? And even this morning as we read these things again, we, we may want to raise our objections again and say, hang on a minute. This is not the God of love. This is, this is not my God. This is not a God who cares for people. Wiping out and destroying and all this. What on earth is going on? Surely, if, if this is God, it's still God of the Old Testament. Well, this is the God who keeps his promises. He always, always keeps his word. Would you want to be here this morning worshipping a God who was fickle? Who didn't keep his word? You could never trust him, could you? So we need to have a God 
who keeps his word. And God is a God who keeps his word. He keeps his promises. God has said that sin will always be punished. He made that clear right at the beginning with Adam and Eve. He said, if you sin, you're going to be punished. And part of that punishment is death. And we're all subject to that consequence of sin today. We face death because of our sin. And the New Testament clearly says, so it's not just the Old Testament, it clearly says that those who continually reject the forgiveness that God offers, their hearts will be hardened. In the same way that God hardened the hearts of those who for centuries refused to bend to his way. Ultimately, those whose hearts will be hardened will be destroyed. They'll have no place in the promised land. It's what the Bible teaches. And it's tough stuff. And it seems harsh. Until we remember, that is, that God is the creator and we are the created. It's his world. He gets to choose how he does things. He gets to choose how he responds to our obedience or our disobedience. And he did warn us at the beginning. He did say, if you sin, there will be punishment. But this is the amazing bit. That God said, I'm going to have to punish the world, but I am going to punish my son as the sacrifice instead. He showed his immense love for us by sacrificing Jesus in our place. And for those who seek God, they'll be forgiven and can enter into and enjoy all the blessings of what God wants. That's anybody from any religion, from any background, no matter what you have done, at any time, at any point in history, if you seek God, he says, if you come to me, ask for forgiveness, you'll be forgiven. You'll be given a place in the promised heart, in the promised land. But the rest, the hearts are hardened. And ultimately, we know the Bible teaches to be destroyed in hell. This is tough stuff. And it is tough stuff. But it does give us an understanding, doesn't it, of just how great God's love is for you and for me. That he made the, made the rules, we broke the rules, we deserved the punishment, yet he took the punishment upon himself. I was sat just at the back on Tuesday morning, I was talking to a lady, and uh, she got the cups, you know, the cups that we have with the coffee and the tea in, and it's got John 3.16 in it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we just sat there and randomly she says to me, she says, Peter, she said, I couldn't do that. She said, what about you? And she must have seen this quizzical look on my face, I hadn't quite got it, and she waved the mug at me, and she said, what about your boys? Could you give one of them? And I said, no. And she said to me, she said, it shows, doesn't it, just how much God loves us yes it does i said and doesn't it to you and i this morning shows us how much god loves us that he was prepared instead of punishing us who deserve it to punish his son who didn't that tells us how much god loves us this morning it's why we come together to worship him it's why we come to show our gratitude to him that we are forgiven, that we're safe, that we're filled with his hope and his peace and his joy. And it's why we should be so concerned for those who aren't Christians that we dedicate our lives to sharing the gospel with them. That they too might know what we know. You see, God's judgment and punishment are a reality. And God's love and forgiveness are also a reality. Because all God's promises are kept. Fourth slide, please, Andrew. Uh, William, even. <laughs> Giants. Andrew. <laughs> James. Come out here a minute, please. Stand there. <laughs> Stand there. Now, in our family, we're fairly tall, but some, it's fair to say, are taller than others. James is six foot, so he tells us. He said it was medically checked at work. But some, some of us in our family, we don't seem quite as tall as some of us. But lots of people do. And then occasionally, when the crowd pulls out of Old Trafford, and we're all together, the four of us, sometimes we lose James in the crowd. We do lose him. He disappears, partly because he's like a little mountain goat and he disappears off and we're still trying to get through the crowd and, and, and it becomes a problem. And then there's Ben. 
So I'm going to stand in for Ben today. I'd be in there in the middle. Uh, and he's Ben, he's probably taller than me now, but don't tell him that. We'll edit that bit out afterwards. Uh, and people tend to look up to him, and he rarely gets lost in the crowd at Old Trafford. And then there's Andrew. Nearly everyone looks up to him, and often they fear him. <laughs> but we never lose him in the Old Trafford crowd. And we often use Andrew to look for James when he disappears. <laughs> Now then, as big as Andy is, he's not as big as an anarchite. Andrew, would you come over here, please? <laughs> James, you can help your little brother. Come and stand next to here. He's going to stand on the top step of those ladders, and I'm going to hope and pray that they hold. OK, so, this is James. He's reasonably big. Andrew's always big. But Andrew, at that height, is not far off where the Anakites were. Imagine that you were going to have to fight the Anakites. James, how are you feeling now, son? <laughs> You'd headbutt him where it hurts. <laughs> right, James, you can go and sit down. Andrew, can you stay there for the rest of the sermon? <laughs> no, get down. He served his purpose. Round of applause for the boys. If you talked about the Anakim, the Anakites, to Israel, there was a shiver went down their spine. You can see why, can't you? And there's archaeological evidence of these, these bodies that are that long, about eight, nine feet long. Can you imagine? Can you imagine an army that stood against you, these Anakites? Well, I want to just to briefly turn the clock back to before Joshua, when those 12 spies that we mentioned earlier were sent by Moses to investigate the land. They come to the border... And he said to them, right, go into the land. I want you to go into the land on a 40-day mission, find out who lives there, find out what it's like, and come back and tell us. And he sends the 12 spies off. And they come back, having come across the Anak, the Anakites, the nine-foot-tall people, the Andrews of this world. They also are referred to in the Bible as Nephilim. You'll find them in there. And in their debrief, which you can read about in Numbers chapter 13, they come back from this, from this mission, this spying mission, and they say to Moses, ten of them say to Moses, that they seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes compared to these. And the look from the giants to them also, they felt they were treated them like grasshoppers. And as a consequence of this, the spies gave a bad report about the land to Moses. It was their reflection, if you like, of their view of God. God was big, but he was no way going to be able to sort these Anakites out. And fear surged through the people. They moaned and they complained. They even said they wanted to go back into Egypt, into captivity, rather than go into the promised land that God had given to them. How ungrateful! But they were so filled with doubt about God that their lives were filled with fear. Two of the spies, however, they said, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, we were on this mission. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. Look at the grapes, look at the fruit, look at the, the opportunity. And if God has given us this land, we shouldn't be fearful. We can take it all because God has promised it to us. Well, the people, they wanted to stone these two because they were already that fearful. Oh, don't listen to them, Moses. Get rid of them. But God wasn't happy with the ten spies, was he? And he brought a plague, and eventually they, they, they were seen off by a plague. And God said this, he said, I will forgive this nation, Moses, but here's the thing. He said, not one of the people who, couldn't, who I rescued out of Egypt is going to make it into the promised land. For the next four decades, you're going to have to wander around the wilderness until they've all died out, and it's their descendants who will go and occupy the land. Only two people are going to go into that land who came out of Egypt. One of whom, of course, was Caleb, who we mentioned earlier, and the other is, of course, none other than our very own Joshua, son of Nun, who is now leading these people who's conquered the land. And I think it makes it really interesting, because, you see, in this debrief review, we've had the southern and we've had the northern kingdoms, and then we've had the conquered list of all these people. And then at the very end, almost as an afterthought, they say, oh, yeah, and we conquered the Anakites as well, and we completely destroyed them. Oh, and the towns, completely destroyed it's interesting, isn't it? Barely a mention about these Anakites. Not even included in the detail of one of the major battles. And all that fear, and all that lost opportunity because they feared the giants for four decades, then they destroyed them completely. And in the debrief, there was barely a note about them. What have your giants this morning? 
What about your giants? What about your fears this morning? What's stopping you trusting God? What's stopping you entering into all that God wants to give you? What's holding you back because of fear? Because of doubt? Maybe you've got doubts about God. Maybe you, you, you doubt God can save you. Maybe you're fearful that you've been so bad in your life that God is not interested in you. He couldn't possibly want to bless you because of who you are or what you've done. Maybe as a church, we're not enjoying all that God wants to bless us with because we fear the giants. We fear that God won't help us, that he won't bless us, that the problem's too big for him. Maybe we doubt that God can save us from the enemy. Maybe we want to go backwards instead of forwards. What giants are causing you to fear this morning? In Pilgrim's Progress, that famous book, John Bunyan describes Christian's approach to the palace beautiful. <coughs> it's where he hoped to get lodging. And he began to walk down this very narrow passageway leading to the porter's lodge. And while he was doing that, he saw two lions in the way. And Bunyan said that the lions were chained, but he saw not the chains. And that's frequently our case, isn't it? We fear because we don't see the chains. Yet the fact that Christ sits at the Father's right hand, far above all the rule and authority and power and dominion, and that he has all things under his feet, according to Ephesians, it means that the power that would destroy us is chained. It can't destroy us because it's chained, it's bound by God. And sometimes we don't see the chains. All the ten spies saw were giants. They saw giants who they feared. They didn't see what Caleb and Joshua saw. They didn't see a land flowing with milk and honey and grapes and all the good things that could be theirs. They didn't twig onto the fact that because God said so and because God is all-powerful, all-knowing and everywhere, that it was entirely possible that they could go and take this land, Anakites included. That God was greater than any and all of the enemies. God kept his promise even with the giants. The Anakites were the first thing that the people feared when they first made the very first foray into the land. And they were the last thing that was reported in the debrief having conquered the land. God knew that he would defeat the giants. Those that didn't believe that, they missed out. They missed out. Those that didn't believe that were, they, they were on the day the giants were defeated by the God whom they trusted and who kept promises, they, they didn't believe and they missed out on all of it. But those who did trust, they, they, they got the benefit. They went into the promised land, they, they conquered the land. Joshua led them. Friends, whatever your giants are this morning that you fear, stop fearing them. Stop fearing them as an individual, as a church, because God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises even when it's tough, even when there's Anakites, even when there's giants, even when things threaten to overthrow us. God promises to be with you, to care for you, to provide for you, to give you rest, to build his church, to equip his church, to resource his church. Don't look at the giants. Look at your God who keeps his promises. Don't look at the giants. Look at the chains. God has it all under control. Finally, final slide, William, number five, please. Rest. Rest. After the land was conquered, we read in the debrief, the very last thing it tells in the review, that the land was at rest from war. They were now in the land, and they were now able to enjoy it with a measure of peace and rest. Now today, of course, our rest doesn't come from occupying the land, but by being in Jesus. Because we are in Jesus, and when we are in Jesus, we enter into his rest. And his rest comes because we put our faith in God, in him. God's salvation is perfect. And ultimately, it gives us rest from sin, from pain, from the problems of this life. We enter into his rest eternally, into the promised land. One day, we will all be there. And God also desires that we, we experience his rest as our daily experience, as part of our daily living. He's won the victory that enables us to enjoy all the benefits and blessings that he wants to give to us. We rest in his love. We rest in his strength. We rest in his joy and all of his blessed characteristics. We rest in him and we can enter that rest daily. But I wonder where's that victory on a Monday morning when things are not going so well? 
when we're moody and we lack joy, when we're frustrated and irritable and impatient, when, it's, when we doubt and when we fear, when we're under the weather, when, when, when we do all those things and we, we lose our rest because we start to look at self instead of being in Christ and we fail to see Jesus. Do you know, so much of what we've looked at over these last 17 sessions has been repeated. It's been repeated behaviour. In our debrief, we can see that when Joshua and Israel did what God told them, and they did it his way, there was victory and there was blessing. When they did it their own way, and they went off on their own, when they doubted, they were defeated and they had no rest. If we want to enter God's rest eternally and daily, we need to trust him and to know that he is always with us and that he always, always keeps his promises. The great missionary Hudson Taylor, who was a great missionary in China, he wrote a letter to his sister back home in England. He wrote to her about his spiritual struggles and we're privileged this morning as we close to read a part of that very letter that that great missionary to China wrote. I'm going to read it for you. He said, Each day brought its register of sin and failure, of lack and power. Then came the question, is there no rescue? Must it be thus to the end, constant conflict, and instead of victory, too often defeat? I hated my sin. And yet I gained no strength against it. I thought that holiness, practical holiness, was to be gradually attained by a diligent use of the means of grace. I felt that there was nothing I so much desired in this world, nothing I so much needed, but so far from in any measure attaining it. The more I pursued and strove after it, the more it eluded my grasp, till hope almost died out. When my agony of soul was at its height, a sentence in a letter from McCarthy was used to open my eyes and the Spirit of God revealed the truth of our oneness with Jesus as I had never known it before. I looked to Jesus and I saw, and when I saw, oh, how the joy flowed, that he had said, I will never leave you. Ah, there it is, I thought. I've striven in vain to rest in him. I'll strive no more. And the sweetest part, if one may speak of one part being sweeter than another, is the rest which full identification with Christ brings. What a letter, what an admission, and what a truth. And then in the late 17th century, Brother Lawrence in front wrote, that, wrote this. In the noise and the clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great a tranquility as if I were on my knees. May God give us all that kind of rest and victory in the hub and bub of the whole world and amidst all the challenges and of all the battles and of all the problems, may we know that rest in Christ which he wants to give us. Final slide, William. And so in our debrief we again see that God keeps his promises. In the geography of the land which we inherit, in whatever length of time the battle takes, in the judgment of those who reject him and the salvation of those who seek him, when we are facing the giants and it's seemingly overwhelming us and in our rest eternally and in our daily lives, God keeps his promises. The lesson to learn from this debrief is simple. Listen to God, live life his way, and all of God's blessings and victory will be yours. Not because I said so, but because God said so, and God keeps his promises. Next week, we're going to bring the second section of Joshua to a close, and we're going to see God keeping his promises as he reveals a list of blessings. Until then, enjoy being in the rest of the living God. Amen. We're going to finish this morning by...